God desires to have every human heart to belong to Him. Our scripture reading comes from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. It's the final chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. And we, we, we will read this today in, in the mindset of a closing letter, something that is important enough to put at the very end of a letter to a group of Christians at a certain church, uh, that they would understand how to operate until Paul returns uh, to them to further teach them and help them continue in their faith. And so I invite you to either read along in your bulletin where it's printed for your convenience, or in your pew Bible, or in your own personal Bible. I invite you to hear these words from Galatians 6, chapter 1. Excuse me, verse 1. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whatever, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those of the family of faith. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace upon, be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one make trouble for me. That is the word every pastor wants to say to their church. <laughs> for I carry the marks of Jesus branded on my body. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and living God, we ask that you would be with us today and help us to embody these words from your scripture, that we might deal with the transgressions of ourselves and of others, but to do so with a spirit of gentleness and of grace and of mercy. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I need to apologize for something today. But before I do that, I think it's helpful for us to look at Galatians chapter 6 to understand why. You see, in Galatians 6, Paul is ending a letter uh, to a group of people who have not listened to him. <laughs> Which is why he said those words, stop causing trouble for me at the very end of his letter. They have stopped listening to Paul and have been listening to other people who have not necessarily taken them away from Jesus, but have been filling their heads with all of these extra things that they do not need, clouding their understanding of God and grace, which Paul says is so vital to understand. In doing so, they have created a mess among themselves, and there are these sins that are abounding in the church, sins that uh, people are apparently very adamant about stamping out, especially those 
who call themselves the circumcised, or the ones who think that they've got religion down. And they're the ones who are sort of this police force uh, going around trying to stop other people from their sin. They don't sin, but they sin, and they want you to stop it, okay? So Paul sees this, and he wants to sort of bring this out to light to talk about this spirit of gentleness. You know, if you were to read the book of Galatians, the letter to the church there, versus the letter of 1 Corinthians, you would notice a difference. Paul, the same author, is writing to two different churches, almost saying two different things. To the people in Corinth, these Christians in Corinth, he's saying, you need to deal with sin. You need to deal with it. You've got people who are acting wrongly in your church. You need to deal with it. To the Galatians, the Christians there, he's saying, calm down, guys. Stop making such a big deal over this. Now, there's a running theory as to why Paul says different things. One is, is that the Corinthian Christians don't want to deal with anything. They sort of look the other way, right? Apparently, some of the people in the Galatian church are way too happy to deal with the sins of others. And Paul says, listen, you got the right idea. We need to deal with sin, but we have to do so with mercy. We need to deal with sin, but we've got to do so with the spirit of gentleness. See, there's, there's this middle way that Paul seems to be mapping, charting for us. We can't just look the other way for our own sin or the sins of others, but we also have to understand that in dealing with sin, our job is not to become a police force for God. Our job is to bring people to a right relationship with God and others. Paul talks about the spirit of gentleness, this, this mercy that we should offer to people who sin. It, it comes from a place of compassion. You know, Paul is writing from a place of compassion. He even apparently, in the end of this letter, is dictating this letter to someone, and he takes the stylus, he takes the pen from the person and says, look at what large letters I'm writing with my own hand. He's, he's basically, at this point, saying, pay attention to what I'm saying because this is important. It's out of a place of love and care for the people in this church in Galatia that Paul is writing. And when you have compassion, it is more likely that you will deal with a spirit of gentleness than one of judgment. So Paul is asking them to deal with sin, but to do so with mercy, with compassion, with an air of God's love in mind. We can do this, to have this spirit of compassion, this spirit of gentleness, in three ways. I think one of the most foundational, important things we can do, if we are thinking about or uh, praying over what it is that we can do to help someone else or to help ourselves, if we are embattled in sin, or they are, is to do what I just said, pray. We pray for the person. You know, praying for someone who is dealing with something might seem like it's a waste of time because the real thing that we need to do is go to them, right? But praying for them helps us remember that our job is not just to go fix the problem for people. Our job is to allow God's grace to act in their lives, for them to understand God's love and care for them. Praying helps kind of put our focus in the right direction before we go and talk to someone. Prayer also in, uh, helps God um, know that we, we are aware that he is already involved in helping this person or, in a sense, helping us. The next thing is that Paul says we need to try to steer people away from falling into sin in the first place, right? Uh, this, this is sort of like teaching someone to drive, right, a car. It is a terrifying thing, isn't it, to be in the passenger seat while someone who is just learning to drive is driving, especially if they get on a highway or, God forbid, the interstate, right? But, but your job in that moment to sit in the passenger seat is to help navigate, help steer, give, give guidance to say, be careful when switching lanes, be careful when you're going this way. And, and so that's the kind of spirit that, that Paul wants us to have with someone who we know is dealing with sin, is to be sort of like a guide, steering them in the direction. We don't want to get into the situation where we start yelling at the person, right? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> uh, because we end up maybe pushing a wedge between ourselves and them. The third thing we can do is what Paul focuses on at the beginning of the letter, 
and that is to carry one another's burdens. Notice the way that Paul talks about this. He doesn't say, tell people how to deal with their own sin, right? He says we should carry one another's burdens, meaning that if we are going to go and to talk to someone about something that they are dealing with, we've got to have the attitude of helpfulness, that I'm willing to help you. I'm willing to help carry this burden with you so that you can seek out forgiveness and restoration. Because that's the goal. The goal is not to point out sin in other people. The, the goal is to help people get away from sin, the transgressions that Paul mentions, and to go into the embrace of the God who created them and loves them and wants them to be in a right relationship with him and with other people. Do you get the difference? We need to be the kind of people that are carrying one another's burdens and dealing with sin for the point of restoration, not for the point of keeping score about who is good and who is not. Now, listen, this is not easy. We live in a world of personal freedom and personal privacy. People really get upset when you start talking about their private lives. And so we've got to be careful if we ever do something like this. Uh, praying for others and the things that they deal with can easily become a way of gossiping about other people. You've seen that probably before in churches. Oh, we need to pray for so-and-so. Did you hear what they did? It can become a form of gossiping, and that is not focused on forgiveness and restoration. That is a way of sort of making us feel like, well, at least we're not that bad. You know, when we're talking about dealing with the sins of others, we can easily stray from being motivated by love for them and fall into being motivated into feeling superior to them. The spirit of gentleness that Paul is advocating for in Galatians means that we've got to understand that we're dealing with people's lives, their hearts, their relationships. We don't meddle for meddling's sake. We get involved because we care about them. We seek for them to be restored. Ultimately, we can't fix other people's problems. But we can help people understand what they're dealing with and maybe who to go to. Whether it's professional help, to God, or maybe how they might be able to restore themselves with others. I think for us to avoid getting into meddling or feeling superior, getting into gossip and all those things that we can easily fall into when we're talking about the sins of others uh, is, is that we've got to have a, a good understanding of who we are in the first place. The very first thing we need to do is to be mindful of our own brokenness. Because we know that we have sinned and we have made mistakes. We have created uh, a wake of damage behind us in our lives. And if we understand that and truly understand that, we will not look at the other person who's dealing with sin as sort of a patient, but more as a friend, a companion. It's a lot easier to carry someone's burdens when you feel like you're in the same boat as they are. And so when I think about this, I think about the idea that we need to be honest about who we are and how broken we are and how much we need God's grace. Because if we can do that, if we can channel that understanding of our own brokenness, our own uh, unworthiness, then we can maybe help other people by standing side by side to them instead of standing over them. The second thing is that whenever we're helping people, we always have to have that goal in mind. And I've said it a couple times already, but that goal has got to be, it has got to be about restoration and forgiveness. It's got to be about that. If it's only about help fixing the situation, I don't think we'll be able to take that person to the final step of restoration and forgiveness. We've always got to have that focus in mind whenever we are trying to help one another. But let's look at that first one there about being mindful of our own brokenness. This includes being honest about our own shortcomings, not to shame ourselves, not to make ourselves feel like we're unworthy of God's love, but to be honest about where we are, who we are, who we are now, 
and who we have been. To open ourselves up to being honest about our brokenness means that we have the potential to be people who are actually capable of forgiving and restoring other people. I think that's important for me to say again. For us to be people capable of helping forgive and restore other people, we have to be people mindful of our own shortcomings. If we cannot help people restore their relationship with God and deal with their sin, we are on the wrong side of God. Because God is always on the side of forgiveness and restoration. So sometimes we do have to deal with the transgressions of others. Sometimes we do need to bring that to light and to be honest about it so that we can find healing. So that we can be reminded of what it was like to steer off course so that we would never do that again. I mentioned at the beginning of my sermon that I have something to apologize for. And the reason I have something to apologize for is because I'm the senior pastor of this church. Many months ago, uh, Angela Martin, one of our pastors, um, was reading a book and uh, told John Carl and Stanley and all the rest of the pastors what she found. You know, it was a book about the history of the Methodist Church in Alabama, and it was a book a little bit about what was happening during the 1950s and early 1960s about uh, segregation in the South. You know, in the 1930s, there were two Methodist churches. There was the Methodist Episcopal Church North and the Methodist Episcopal Church South. And in 1939, those two uh, churches merged to become the Methodist Church. It wasn't until 1968 that we became the United Methodist Church. That's history that I know you were just waiting to hear today. Well, in the 1950s, as you know, Alabama was struggling with segregation. And this was happening not only in our cities and our communities, but it was happening in our churches. Because the Methodist Church had combined to form one national uh, um, church, there was a movement towards desegregation in the United Methodist Church, or the Methodist Church. It wasn't united yet. What happened is that there were two different conferences in Alabama. There was the conference for white churches, and there was a central conference for African American churches. Talk about merging these two different conferences into one uh, really rattled some churches. Uh, the book talked about Highlands United Methodist Church uh, in Southside, and it talked about Woodline United Methodist Church. In fact, according to the author, uh, Bull Connor, who was a member of Woodline United Methodist Church, used to stand up in the middle of the sermon and argue about segregation with the pastor there. This was all going on in the 1950s. And so church members from area churches, in, in Birmingham especially, started forming a group of people called the Methodist Layman's Union. And the Methodist Layman's Union main objective was to stop desegregation within the local church of the Methodist Church. Uh, this movement sort of began uh, picking up steam uh, around Alabama. In the book Go and Be Reconciled, the book I'm mentioning by William Nicholas, it says that churches in Gunnersville, Roanoke, and Sylacauga joined uh, some Birmingham churches in publicly stating that they were in favor of preserving segregation within the Methodist church. Our church was one of the four churches listed in the Birmingham area. Now that was a different time. It was a long time ago, almost 60 years ago. Uh, but I think that we need to, or at least I need to, apologize that our church was a part of that. Because we were on the wrong side of God. Some people focus on being on the wrong side of history. I don't know that Christians really should worry too much about that. You know, being on the wrong side of history is depending on the author writing the history book. You can be a hero in history or an enemy in history, depending on who wrote the book. I don't know if we should really worry too much about being on the wrong side of history. I think as Christians, we need to be focused on being on the wrong side of God. And when we are on the wrong side of God, we need to be honest about it. 
Not to shame anyone for a part they played into it, but to understand that sometimes when we are not focused on being who God is calling us to be, it is easy for us to slide into being on the wrong side of God. I know I have used this image too many times, uh, but I'm going to use it again because I find it so very helpful in understanding how we can slide into being on the wrong side of God. St. Augustine, a, a saint uh, in the church, famous, famous saint uh, from North Africa, said that when we uh, become pulled into sin, it is like, in Latin, curvatus in si, means curved in upon yourself. So when, when you're in sin, when you're trapped in sin, this is what is literally happening to you. You're closing yourself off from God, and you're closing yourself off from your neighbors. You're saying that what I want and what I need is more important than what you want and you need. And he says, this is sin at its core. Because we turn away from God and what God calls us to do, to love, our, love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we pull away from God, and we can think we're doing the right thing. We can think we're doing what God wants us to do, but because we've cut ourselves off from God by turning away from Him and turning towards ourselves, we no longer have that channel open to say, God, is this really what you want us to do? That is where I'm afraid we get when we're on the wrong side of God, when we care only about what we want and what we think is right. We can't judge what is right and wrong based on the culture. We've got to base what is right or wrong based on who God has revealed to be to us through Jesus Christ. Paul is trying to do that to the church in Galatia. He's saying, yes, we get it. We're supposed to deal with sin but do so with the spirit of gentleness because your job is not to be the police of God. Your job is to help restore people to right relationship with God and others. Friends, that's the side that God is on. God desires to have every human heart to belong to him. God desires for all of us, all of us, to be within his church. But for that to happen, we've got to embody his love and his grace and his truth into our lives, into our words, and into our interactions with others. If we turn ourselves off from God, if we fall into that incurvatus in sea, we will not embody his love and grace. We will not be effective in helping people escape from the trap of their sin. We have to be able to look at God and to be able to look at others, to listen to what God uh, is saying to us, what direction we need to go in, and to make sure that we are never on the wrong side of God. Hopefully, if that's the case, we will become people capable of forgiving and restoring others. Amen and amen.